Hello, welcome. We're just letting some people kind of trickle in. Thank you, everybody who's joining for joining us on this rainy spring day. I'm just going to give it just a little bit, just as people are trickling in. Um, but anyway, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for the Ermer and Herbert Barnes Endowed Lecture in conversation with artist uh, Odili Donald Odita. Uh, so my name is Greg Stewart. I'm the coordinator of adult public programs here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we're really excited to have Odili here with us tonight um, to talk about uh, his new commission, um, Walls of Change, which is part of the exhibition, New Grit, Art in Philly Now which will open on May 7th. So you're getting a little preview here tonight. New Grit Art and Philly Now uh, really champions Philadelphia's uh, contemporary art scene through a close look at 25 artists who's, who work here, live here, or who have been inspired by the time in their city. Uh, one of five creations or commissions created for this exhibition, Odili's Wall of Change will greet visitors to the museum's new uh, 10,000 foot gallery spaces for modern and contemporary art. So welcome, Odili. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so basically tonight, Odili will present a bit about his work and then we'll be in conversation with Erica Battle, who you also see on the screen, uh, who is the John Alchin and Hal Marriott Associate Curator of Contemporary Art and the lead curator of New Grit. So welcome, Erica. Thanks, Greg, and welcome everyone else. Looking forward to talking a little later. Um, so before we get started, I just want to go over some housekeeping. Uh, some of this will be very familiar to you if you've been on other Zoom programs. Um, but uh, just a little bit about the structure of the program tonight. So we'll have, as I mentioned, a presentation from Odili, uh, followed by a conversation between Odili and Erica. And then we will take questions from you at the end. You're in Zoom webinar, so your camera and microphones are turned off, but you can ask uh, questions when it's time to do so by using the Q&A feature. And questions that you really like can be upvoted so that they rise to the top. And, and I'll be the one reading the questions to Odili and to Erica. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar. And this program is being recorded and we will send the recording to everyone who is registered. Um, and I just wanted to give a, a big thanks to the Barnes family, um, and I know some of them are here tonight, um, uh, for their generous support of this lecture. And so now I'm going to introduce um, Odili. So uh, Odili Donald Odita is an abstract painter whose work explores how color can imbue meaning and trigger profound social and political connotations. By hand mixing his color palette as he paints, he never uses the same color twice and is guided by an intuitive process that mines his memory, architecture, and his dual American, uh, Nigerian American identity. His work has been widely exhibited in both solo and group exhibitions across the globe, including at the Savannah College of Art and Design, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts San Francisco, the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Institute of Contemporary Art here in Philly. Odita's installation, Give Me Shelter, was featured prominently at the 52nd Venice Biennale exhibition, Think With the Senses, Feel With the Mind, which was curated by Robert Storr. Uh, his work can be found in the permanent collections of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Birmingham uh, Museum of Art, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, among others. He's based in the Philadelphia area and is currently professor of painting at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture. Um, in Philadelphia. So I'm going to thank you. Is it my turn now? Great. <laughs> thank you uh, for inviting me here to speak uh, for this lecture, important lecture series. And um, I'm going to, I have a lot of images to share. I'm going to be as quick as I can to get through them. And then we'll just continue with our discussion uh, this evening. Um, going to go here. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with this slide. Uh, this slide is a group of uh, 
undergraduates in 1958 at the university, the Nigerian College of Arts, Science, Technology, the, the Nigerian College of Arts, Science and Technology, that's now called the Amadou Bello University in Zaria. This group of young artists um, are important for me to share with the group of you here because I want to talk about what underscores what underscored my piece for Walls of Change and what underscores the body of my work as an artist. These artists wanted to make a change in how their work was seen and how the work was to be received by challenging the curriculum at their university. What they wanted to do was to change the way in which they were being taught art, not only as uh, a product of uh, Western European uh, academic structure, but something that would include and involve their local experience, their indigenous, indigenous experience. So what they wanted to do was to basically make this change in a way in which that it would reflect their con consciousness and the way in which they were um, wanting to make their paintings. Now, their name, Zaria Art Society, also um, is understood as Zaria Rebels because of this action, what they wanted to do. What's important about this group is the way in which they wanted to challenge and make their voices heard. And the work that they made put them at the forefront of history in Nigeria as the face of Nigerian modernism. One specific person here that we see here is uh, very important to me because he's my father and he was part of this founding group the Zaria Rebels or the Zaria Art Society. And why I feel that this is important to mention here is because of their age. They were college students. This is a space in which people young enough have the sense of power, the sense of righteousness to be able to make that change. And it grows forward from this point. And we'll see with the next works how I'm going to explain this through my work. Okay, this painting, Don't Blink, this next painting, Changes. These were made after my uh, graduate experience at Bennington College. They were focused on how I was looking at art at the time, combining um, the computer, thinking through television and cinema, and also con contemplating my own identity and my own experience as a, as a growing young person, an African in America, a Nigerian in America. What we have here is this painting change changes. And we have a painting that symbolizes just shapes, chevron shapes, colors. But in this case, we have these four different colors that become platforms or backgrounds for the painting. If I'm to understand in this case that the ground or the foundation for this painting is dark blue, then we have everything else sitting upon that. And that becomes the figure on top of the ground. But what if the ground were yellow? Then we have a different combination of colors on this ground. And then if the ground were orange, that would be the case for this orange ground and then the figures on top of the orange and vice versa for the soft blue. So what I was thinking about and contemplating was my sense of double consciousness, the experience I was having of this sort growing up in America, living in a Nigerian household within a Nigerian bubble, and then going to school and experiencing the American dream or American life in, in high school. And such as that, that these worlds were separate. There was not really a lot of commingling in this relationship in the way I was living. So for me, it was a process of learning how to adapt to the situation of difference, being able to speak in one way in one place and to speak in another way in a different place. My home, the Nigerian household, and in the American schools in the suburbs that I grew up in. I was um, searching through this, looking at the computer, looking at screensavers, thinking about the death of painting and thinking also about identity. And at a certain point, painting didn't make sense for me anymore. And so I stopped painting and started to curate, started to write about work at first, and then started to make uh, photo-based work that was dealing with the issues of identity politics. But as I realized later, I was thinking through it as a painter. So these magazines, I started working with um, the founders of the ma both magazines. With Nka Contemporary of African Art, it was Okwi and Wizor. And with Arud Magazine, it was Ike Ude. Uh, Okwi 
I met through this gallerist named Skoto, who had a gallery, Skoto Gallery in Soho at the time, uh, 1993, 1994, uh, on Prince Street. And Okwi had met my father, uh, who founded the History of African Art program at Ohio State University in the early 70s. He met with my father and other scholars in the country to get them on his board as, as um, editors and, and uh, to substantiate the magazine. So in fact, Skoto and then my father said, you should speak to this guy, Okwi Anwazor. We got along well and I started writing for the magazine and later on I would work with him on different projects. A, with a rude magazine and Ike Ude, it was through the Nka group that I met uh, Ike. So here's a picture of, of these people, Okwi, Oluwagwibe, who was there in the early days as well, Ike Ude, and myself with Ike. Um, this was a really important and fertile time for identity politics relative to the African dias diasporic experience. And for me, it was really uh, an important and motivating time as a person who is beginning to realize themselves, as a young person beginning to, re to realize themselves as a Nigerian uh, in America, as a creative person who has the ability to speak from their experience and not only recite the Western one. So it was really amazing, the people we met, uh, the things we did, the traveling we did, the writing I was able to do, and the studios I was able to visit. And this is important to me and my growth as a painter was the studios that I was able to visit. Uh, so this is an example of my uh, photo-based work, Authentic African, um, a conceptual piece questioning, uh, actually posing a question to the American viewer, who is the authentic African? And with the test bubbles of yes and no at the bottom, that signified the experience that the viewer had to go through to decipher this question. This is another piece, Endorphin, uh, turned into a bus shelter uh, poster for the jo second Johannesburg Biennale that uh, Okwi curated uh, in 1997. For Okwi, he selected this image, which originated as a small collage into this poster uh, set up around the city of Johannesburg. For Okwi, this signified the black male as a living target. And during this exhibition, well, the truth and reconciliation trials were going on. So. Uh, this was a very significant piece during that, uh, during that time. Uh, this piece, Mirror, is really important in the trajectory of my work in the sense that it speaks to uh, how I'm starting to conceptualize the nature of body and skin and body and space. This pigmented shape on the wall was, was placed on the wall after finding, traveling to the site in Poland, finding a mirror like this at this scale, tracing the mirror and then placing the pigment onto the wall. So in one sense, it became this kind of um, uh, on-site, non-studio based piece in the, in the wall. But at the same instance, it was my way of trying to mark a certain kind of, um, if not literally home, a certain kind of sanctuary where the body sitting in this white space can sit fixed without any treachery or without any harm coming to it. So this is my uh, first one-person show, uh, Color Theory, at uh, the Florence Lynch Gallery in 1999. Uh, the significance of this show is my wanting to speak about the world and about the real through abstraction and having to find a way or a code to be able to have this said and heard without uh, the co-option co of, say, Western critics or Western theories uh, super be, becoming superimposed on my paintings. Uh, this is a piece from the show. Uh, and it, that's a cover of a Vogue magazine uh, from the time. Uh, this is a small image from another page in a Vogue magazine. Uh, I just cut out the mail and put the uh, black space behind there. And another piece uh, called Object, which has a figure of a man uh, as zombie, uh, from the film, it's a film still from the movie Walk with a Zombie, and a woman is holding a flashlight to uh, unveil this or discover this black body in the in this dark space. And synonymous to that is the uh, pigmented rectangles with 
light bulbs hanging in front of them to mimic or mirror the action that you see in the image. So there's this duality between the abstraction and figuration going on here as well. And in the last room, we have these paintings. What was important for me in this show was to really speak about what I wanted to say through my paintings versus what critics might say is, oh, this is in the space of Frank Stella. Oh, this is in the space of Kenneth Nolan. And artists that I appreciate, nonetheless, work that I was not emulating at all. Work, uh, this work here was coming from a different experience and a different process. And hopefully we'll be able to expand upon that in the, the rest of the slides here. Now, uh, this is also something I wanna show to the audience. This is what I call my black album. And it's a collection. This is just samples from a collection of images I've collected over 10 years from 1995 to 2005. And in my uh, work, these images were collected as source material for the photo based pieces I was making during this time in the early in the mid early and mid 90s. And uh, besides making the photo based pieces, I was also drawing from these uh, images. And what I wanted to find was my way of getting into a certain kind of psychology of what it means to digest this imagery, because in most cases it was primarily negative. This is, these are advertisements, um, images of black bodies doing different things in different kind of uh, positions and poses and whatnot. And my idea in drawing from them was to ask the question of what am I regurgitating and what am I retaining from these images that are presented to the world in this way from mass market, mass media advertising. Uh, this piece in Nagata de Vida was uh, made for uh, my second one person, my second one person show. Um, no, actually, my first one person show at Jack Shaman Gallery. And here in the back was this painting that Rob Storr saw, and he understood it well enough to be able to then include me in the Venice, his Venice Biennale, the 52nd Venice Biennale in 2007. What he understood was that center split, which is significant in different ways in my work, he understood it in the way in which it could embody this entire uh, intersection space. Uh, this is a space that uh, was between two artists. There in the back, you'll see the paintings of Sigmar Polke. And on the other side was the uh, artist uh, Nancy Spiro, two amazing artists that I was able to exhibit with amongst others in this uh, exhibition. Um, I had the opportunity of meeting um, with a number of the artists uh, during the process of putting up this show. I was in Italy for about uh, five weeks to install with 18 assistants uh, helping me with these uh, eight walls, uh, 10 meters by 20 meters high. Um, I met with Ellsworth Kelly and Sigmar Polke. Sigmar said to me, uh, he said, we had a small chat and I was introduced to him through his assistant that was there during the five weeks and we became friends. And he said to me, uh, basically, it's, it's very good that you're here, saying that to me and pointing at me as he's speaking. And then with Ellsworth, Ellsworth said to me, my work is before the war and your work is after. And that struck me in a really uh, significant way, which uh, I'm still uh, unpacking, but uh, it was really beautiful statement and he was a really beautiful man. Um, so after that uh, Biennale, uh, I was able to expand my project further and I was getting invitations to explore and experiment the possibility of these paintings in, in different spaces. And really it was all about possibility for me here to explore what the effects of a space would do with painting and how painting can interact with the space. It comes to being the fact that this is the history of painting, the history of Western painting as we know it is seen and understood as starting from uh, being created on walls and then switching to uh, the canvas support or the, can the, the frame structure that can travel and be mobile. So what we have here is uh, in flow, we have different situations that the painting exists and in the ways in which the painting can flow literally through the space. Uh, this is third space at uh, um, the ICA at uh, UPenn. Uh, people might remember this installation. It was a really difficult installation because of the nature and structure of the space. A lot of movement in the space in a narrow, long corridor like space. And I understood so many ways in which I could experience viewing the painting to the point of 
this picture, which was taken across the street, outside and across the street of the painting, is to understand that there's so many possibilities and ways in which we can engage other than this traditional six to eight feet in front and center of a painting. Uh, another experience here, post-perfect, we can see the idea of reflection in the back of the space is a purple wall, and uh, there's a pool there. And I was really just, um, I was actually wowed by the experience of seeing the reflection of the water in the reflecting pool becoming immersed and flowing outward into the minor space of the Fumihiko Maki building here at Yerba, Yerba Buena. This is up and away made in a student dorm at Princeton Butler College, work made to speak about the exploration of mind and spirit in a school, uh, light and vision. The title of this is a pun on the title of a song by David Bowie, Sound and Vision. And in light and vision, I'm speaking about a type of clarity and joy that comes out of discussion and contemplation with others. This is done at the US Mission for the United Nations. This is the first floor. And this is the second floor. Here we have the press room, and this work is situated right outside where people are gathering to speak after uh, important events. Time and time, a wall made at the um, the fourth oldest hospital in America, uh, the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, this wall is a five thousand square foot painting. It was made so people in the hospital rooms looking out at this wall from infirm infirmaries at the top seventh floor to very ill patients on the third floor because the third floor is the base of this wall. It would give them the opportunity in my mind and in the way I work the painting to be able to get up from their beds if possible to look at the painting that was seen in their cut frame window and then possibly then the rest of it as they would look out the window to see what the picture became. Uh, this is a reflection on history, heaven's gate. And the question here is conceptual for me is, why does heaven have a gate? And what is this heaven in this space uh, made at Savannah College of Art and Design in, the, in, uh, in Savannah, Georgia? This piece, Our House, reflecting on the idea of community and responsibility. The question for me here was, if this is our house, what are we going to, to do to maintain it? There was this line that I had in the pattern that would create a slice between this half and that half, and in a certain sense, create a kind of visual um, play with the image of the painting and the structure of the building where it might look like this part of the building would slide off that. And the question then is, what are we going to do for our city to keep it safe or to keep it together? Uh, by the way, I need to add that this is the only installation I've done with the mural arts program. Um, I have no other uh, uh, painting I've done with them. Uh, this painting is now covered by another building next to Brandywine Workshop, but the owner of the building, Alan Edmonds, I think did a very smart thing by conserving this painting for time until somebody else has the chance to figure out how to get in there. A painting, a building is built next to it, but not covering that, that painting. Uh, this is RISE at uh, Ezra Stiles College at Yale University. And what's important to me, and we start to see in some of the wall installations, is the activation of the space with the body. Shadow and light for Julian Francis Abel at the Nasher Museum of Art. Uh, this is important for me because it's significant as a commemoration for Julian Francis Abel. Uh, as I was making this installation, I learned about this significant architect who put, um, who was the, as we know with the PMA, he did the drawings for the Philadelphia Museum of Art. He was uh, the class president of uh, his class as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania Architectural School. He went on to design and build the uh, Widener Library amongst other buildings in uh, 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 at Harvard and uh, in New York, he built uh, uh, many other buildings. And significantly, he put together um, some of the, he built some of the most important buildings, had built some of the most important buildings on the campus of Duke University. But the myth goes that he was never able to see those buildings because of Jim Crow laws uh, that occurred 
at the time in the South. This is Time Bridge, also at, uh, made through Duke, a commission through Duke University. And this is significant in the way in which it reflects the, to me, it's a forbearing of the flag work that I am now doing as well. Velocity, velocity of Change at Jack Shaman Gallery. And uh, again, this situation of bodies in front of the work, declaring themselves and declaring the many different spaces that can exist in these paintings with these bodies interacting in this space. Constellation uh, made for the Cleveland Triennial. That this is a painting freeform at the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice in New York. Mamba Negra at the ICA Miami, still up currently, based on the Mambra ne Mamba Negra uh, dance group uh, that are about direct social action in their work as musicians and DJs. And currently a uh, procession that's up at, in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, just finished. And then we have here uh, what I started to use as inspiration for the Walls of Change piece I have at now at the, at the PMA, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, this was really thought out uh, in total uh, over the summer. Uh, there were a lot of ideas that I had going through uh, the process of designing, drawing, and making this work in my mind and then physically on paper. Uh, I, pose this here because the content of the words here are very, very foundational to what I was thinking of in this piece, Walls of Change. The colors that are here are colors that I was thinking of and input into the installation in my own way. We have images of people using the museum and the space of the museum to make protest against what, against what was happening nationally. We see protests that were uh, held in front of the museum, the museum as a backdrop for all this civil and social unrest. And here we have the museum held as a, a backdrop to performances in as vigils and as commemorations for people that were taken by uh, police violence. And here we have the beginning of the installation before the walls were put in and so forth. We walked in to see how, what everything would be and how we would, uh, how I would begin to plan uh, for the installation process. And then in the beginning here, we have what we are doing, putting up the line and drawing for the color to come up afterwards. Taping of the shapes. for the development. And then we have final images of the installation where we can go back and see in this one, just what we have is just a raw space, essentially with some building material placed up here to what we have here. This place in this space is absolutely gorgeous. The way that the light comes in, the way that everything is playing with each other, uh, even here at the top part, you'll notice when you go through the space, you'll see color as, as if it's melting into the ceiling. The Geary building, uh, the Geary extension is really important in the way he tries to bring in light and sight lines from the city into the space. And that's really um, something that's unique to this new space. And pictures don't do justice for what it is to walk, walk through a space, to actually feel what a space can do. There are many different things I, in many different events, I put into this installation to be able to way, to be able to make the body feel the change and the impact of the dynamic of the forms and shape and color that are existing and working in the space. And hopefully we will be able to talk more about some of the details and process of work that I did for that installation. But I wanna close with some paintings here. 
just to show how there is this connection between the paintings and the wall installations. They, for me in my practice, help each other. I grow from the paintings and as much as I grow from the installations and they actually feed into to each other in the way in which uh, they speak to the possi possibility in painting. They speak to the nature of drawing and color and how they are, uh, they coexist in a means to be able to uh, uh, identify the mind and identify narrative and identify color in very specific and meaningful ways. Structure that comes to the sense of concepts of tension and angst and um, things that are part of my experience as a, as a being, as a human being. For me, the abstract is not something that I can say is uh, unreal or dissociated from life. But for me, abstraction is a means of getting to the real in the most direct way. Uh, I actually look at figuration as something more abstract than, than abstraction itself for the fact that you have the, uh, this idea of representation. When you're talking about representation, you're talking about a remove from the experience of the world and the way in which the representation it exists in a sense as a copy of something or exists as something else than what you are actually referring that image to. So we can talk about that a little bit more. These are paintings I'm doing now in wood panels as well. And the flag work, uh, the first flag work I did for Prospect 4. This is currently at uh, the University of Houston, uh, negative space in the exhibition color field. And this is a, from a exhibition from periphery to center. This is called X, this flag. It's part of a uh, 15 flag series. And that's it. So I'm gonna stop the share. And then, uh, we can continue. Yeah, thank you, Odili. So I just wanted to emphasize how exciting this is because this is the first time that uh, you are seeing um, the completed work. I mean, not you, Odili, the our audience. Uh, so that's really um, lovely that we get to do that tonight. Um, and we just, we have a nice uh, time-lapse video that we wanted to show um, before I kind of invite Erica to um, come back and, and ask some questions here. Um, so Steve, if you want to show that time lapse that kind of shows the, the creation of this work in, in the galleries. Great, and now I think I'll turn it over to Erica. Great, thank you, Greg. And thank you so much, Odili. It's so nice to see you uh, from across town. Great. Odili's uh, in his home uh, and I am in my office at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and welcome again to everyone joining us today uh, and joining us for this part of the conversation. I see a lot of questions starting to come through on the chat function, so please continue, and the Q&A function rather. So please continue to ask questions and Greg will help us moderate and answer some of those questions at the end of my and Odili's conversation. Um, Odili, you gave us so much to think about and to respond to in your talk, which really, you know, covered an incredible arc in your own creative history and practice, starting with your own father and his um, uh, creative life uh, as part of the uh, Zuria Art Society. So it, there's a lot here. Um, so much of what you talked about really touched on issues around site specificity and context. Um, and I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about time as well in your work. So looking at all these 
projects um, that you've done. And, you know, as we talk, the, the slideshow will keep kind of um, looping so people can follow along from the, the Johannesburg moment. Um, I love this, this mirror piece in that moment of the first putting pigment on the wall. Um, it struck me kind of in looking at some of these earlier moments, uh, which happen to be passing through the screen right now, um, especially in your kind of collections of ephemera and um, you know, responding to, to media images, um, particularly about uh, the black body in media, that in addition to space, which we are so accustomed talking to about, uh, to talking about within your work in terms of work that's on the walls of all these great museum spaces and, and certain sites, there's really a sense of time and, and place in your work as well. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that kind of transposes and translates into your kind of larger abstract uh, uh, works and wall installations, clearly with something like Resistance, the Black Album, um, you're literally capturing the media at the moment of the, of the time. Um, but I wonder if we could also think about your larger uh, wall installations as our own kind of time capsules. And of course, I'm thinking very much um, in terms of walls of change, uh, particularly um, because it was so very much, it ended up uh, being so informed by the conversations uh, we were having and, and the entire shift to that uh, everyone experienced um, from protest and pandemic, um, you know, around 2020. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and kind of how uh, context, history and time inform your approach to your, your uh, installations. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really about living in the moment. Uh, if, the, if George Floyd hadn't been murdered as he was, if Breonna Taylor hadn't been murdered as she was and, and so on and so forth, we, I would probably be talking about something else. Uh, those 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 situations were significant not only for me but for everybody in the country and around the world, and um, it was significant in a way in which that the world took the challenge of of what happened, in as much as just America, uh, the world, and it was something that was overwhelming to to see because it would could be just another police killing a black person, uh, but it was. Um, seen in a way that this has to just stop. This is, this is not, um, this is just too much. And so for me, I was looking at different aspects of the Philadelphia in relation to the space it was in when initially. I was thinking of the, the, the museum mile, the, the, the colony of trees, the, all of this stuff naturally, uh, wanting to include or talk about that. And then I started to see that the museum was being used as this backdrop Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the show along the way, the show kept cha changing and the mm -hmm. idea of the show was just evolving. But I was noticing this thing about the museum as this backdrop and it was significant for me because it was like, okay, we are, these, these, this group of artists were, were, were selected to, in a way, represent a type a certain kind of vitality. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much, you know, shows can always be bigger and can include more. It's, it's not about this more than that. It's just that at this point, you have what we have. And for me, seeing this, um, the situation where people, you know, regular people were coming to the museum to make their statements to, uh, in Philadelphia uh, and to the world, even when that uh, uh, encampment of land was taken over by homeless people and they wanted to speak about uh, housing equity, this was really, and it was so close to the museum. It's the way in which people understand that the museum is kind of a marker in the city. It's kind of a center, a shift from one space to another. I look at it, Philadelphia is almost as if there are five plus areas in the city, in just the city of Philadelphia. You drive from one area to the next and it's completely a different kind of, of, of city, but it's all called Philadelphia. And it has the largest, next to Central Park, the largest um, green space within it. So it, it, it's seeing all this, the fact of seeing all this, uh, the situation of the museum as backdrop was parallel to me thinking of, of a canvas or a piece of paper where you have, or even a sculpture, you have this structure that you do stuff on. You have this surface that you have aesthetic inquiry and activity on. And so for me, I started to really just think of how I can build this idea of this of the museum as as essentially a raw canvas where all these artists in the show all these people activists activists out there 
activating their ideas with the building and using it as a backdrop to speak to the world. I think that speaks so, um, you know, specifically to this exact moment that we we're planning this commission. Um, I'm trying to remember, and I should have gone back on my own, I, I'm sure I have it in my notes somewhere, the first time we kind of had a conversation that was in your studio, and it was probably two to three years ago by now, uh, certainly a time that was very I remember different. it exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a time very different, and I think I, I snuck in, I, I brought some floor plans, I think you were the yes. first people, uh, first, first person, first artist that I showed the floor plans to for these new spaces, and just to give our audience a little bit more context, we have this amazing um, expansion project that is on the cusp of opening. It'll open in early May uh, to the public and includes 10,000 square foot new uh, galleries for modern contemporary art on one side for the show that we're talking about will take place and a kind of mirror uh, another wing um, on the other side for American art up into 1850 and all these other kind of spaces for the public to circulate, to enter the building at different places, to uh, enjoy themselves and to see art. So the building itself is transforming. And the building um, was opened originally in 1928. So we were also uh, a couple of years shy of our uh, building centennial, which is hard to hard to believe. So it's a moment of great, it was already going to be a moment of great change and transformation for the museum. Um, and we were exploring ideas around that that were largely around space and architecture and what it meant to have these new spaces, uh, these expanded spaces. And um, I'm glad we got to see the, the time-lapse video because it gave, I think, the audience a much better sense of like the amazing light that these uh, windows get. And when you walk into these spaces, as you see the window wells that you see on your screen right now and to, to your right, um, you're able to turn and see down um, the parkway to City Hall. So immediately your body is situated in the building um, with reference to where you are in the museum and to the city. So there's a real kind of contextuality to that, that experience, um, which is really, uh, I think as, was one of the drivers of our conversation, which is what does it mean for our city right now to have this new space for particularly in this case, contemporary art, um, for us to organize an exhibition that was championing uh, Philadelphia. And we kind of started that and really started with space. Um, and I love the shot of your first site visit where we, we basically just had put some walls up. Um, it was even more raw, you know, at one point. And um, one of the reasons, just to tell the audience too, that we don't have a lot of polished photography of the uh, mural is that we are currently installing the show. And so there's masonite on the floor and there's lots of stuff uh, going on in and around the mural right now. Um, but it is really hard to capture in photographs because you have to kind of walk through it. And this idea of that long corridor space processional, the body was always kind of at the heart of what you were thinking about. But then fast, and I, we, we talked about the, the history of the building and its architecture, um, and then kind of fast forward to the spring of 2020 when really everything changed. Um, can you walk us through a little bit more kind of what you had been thinking before that moment about this commission and then how maybe some of those ideas were tied into what you ultimately did or did you completely kind of reform and reshape um, your ideas around walls of change? Because as I said before, we were still thinking about transformation, but it was architectural, it was formal, it was compositional. It was about the experience of a space. And now we're talking about change in terms of experience, the changing experience of, of a culture really writ large. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's situations that happened in the painting where, um, for example, very tough part of the work is the situation of the color itself. Uh, on, especially on the wall that's facing the windows. Um, I was thinking a lot about the idea of the groups of people. And I was thinking about the groups of people in a couple of different ways in which they can be seen as oppositional. But then I was thinking there are all sorts of people um, together in opposition to police brutality, let's say, or, or the abuse of power. Because mm -hmm. there are many forms of power we've seen uh, enacted over the summer from police brutality to uh, the abuse of women through the, uh, within the Me Too movement. And then we have the situation of uh, inequity with housing. And then we have COVID and all the problems that were going on with COVID as well. The lockdown and the ways in which people acted, you know, or reacted to being locked down, to wearing masks, 
to being around others. And this idea also of respect in a sense of, uh, do I have the power and do I, do I allow myself to make other people sick? Can I protect other people in as much as I protect myself? Will I protect other people in as much as I protect, can protect myself? So, and then we have the presidential election. So there are so many uh, issues at hand and so many, just so many direct conflicts at hand uh, at this time. But I was thinking about the idea of, of color representing and then the shapes representing crowds of people. Mm -hmm. And then what could embody those that what could, how color can, could signify or speak of the body of people and people power uh, in the charge against uh, or the charge for justice. Not to think of it as a negative, but as a positive, as a, as a charge for justice. Mm -hmm. So there is a way in which the, the work moves through the space. I do see the space direction moving and the piece moving directionally through the space. And then on the other side, I knew that there's going to be a correlation between the light, the natural light coming through, and then this interior light, or rather passion, the flame. That's, there's a kind of signifier shape I have that's against the window, the, on the window side, that is the flame. And we can think of that flame in many things as truth and knowledge, mm -hmm. justice, passion for, for fighting, the heat of passion, uh, anger, let's say. All of these things, uh, uh, the great title, The Fire Next Time from mm -hmm. James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this fire element is on this other side and it expands and grows to this point of contestation between a light and a dark side. And that also comes back for me to this old notion of drawing in which we have you know, light and shadow. Right. And what that means when we talk about uh, this, what we talk about how things are distinguished in, sp in the space of a drawing mm -hmm. and how we understand that shadow is not darkness without light or light without a light that is diminishing, but the, in fact, it's just another condition of light. The right. same way that we look at light value mm -hmm. it's just another condition of light one is not positive one is not negative but they are just different conditions of light so then when i'm thinking about the wall facing the window i'm thinking about this notion of in fact you'll see that the, there's a paler spot part and then a very colorful part and then a dark part and in the light part those are essentially coming from the colors of the words the, uh, the word of God song yeah yes mm -hmm. Yeah, bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. So that color comes from that image, essentially. But I'm also thinking of this foundational space of white, the white as a foundational space. And what does this mean when we have lighter colors creating a dissolve in the structure of this pattern here or this drawing space here? What does that dissolve refer to? What, is it, what does it mean that this space is coming from and being built out of white? And then so I'm thinking about it conceptually as well as aesthetically. Right. Then there's the other side, the dark, dark side, the rich side. What is, how does that relate to this idea of shadow and the diminishment of light or the perspective, let's say, of, of black consciousness and black bodies? And then we have to, I have to ask the question about black light versus mm -hmm. white light. And then is there a difference? Are there two different lights? One could say maybe in this world there are two different lights because with black art, or with black um, narrative, it's always seen as a derivative. It's always seen in a space of darkness, not given its own light, not being allowed to exist on its own terms, but always placed in the space of white light and then white consideration and then white devaluation. So those are the kinds of things I think about with black art. But I also know that what we have here is a situation in the center is and I want to jump to that before I go back to what I was saying about black versus white. Mm -hmm. Center, we talk about color in the sense of the fullness of the world. If we are watching black and white movies, we can still indicate the objects in the movie, but we're not seeing the fullness, the richness of life itself, where this other specific information comes in. It's the world in the round. Color for me is the world in the round. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at this binary of dark and light and black and white and seeing how they inform each other to make this physical space in the center of it realized and that it is necessary for in fact all of this to come together rather all this difference to come together 
to make okay. something strong, valuable, and real. I don't know if Steve can pause on this image just to give our um, an audience a chance to kind of see some of the ideas that Odile is talking to, because I think this image does a lot to kind of fill in some of that, um, the visual information that you're, you're talking to, Odile. So for example, in this image, which is only one segment, and I want to talk about scale here as well. Um, you know, I think you were saying it's probably in terms of linear feet might be one of your longest, uh, longest commissions. It really fills every wall. I feel like uh, we, we talked about it being in 10, 10 parts, almost of a painting in 10 parts, which yes. incidentally is how painting Cy in Twombly, 10 parts. Yeah, which is incidentally how Cy Twombly describes 50 Days at Ilium, which is right downstairs for me right now. Um, so the different palettes that you were mentioning, this kind of lighter palette, kind of pastels, you can see all the way at the left of this image, the kind of slightly warmer, but almost more primary feeling palette that's in the middle. Uh, and then this kind of bold, darker, kind of very purple um, driven palette uh, at mm -hmm. the end. And so you have these like three groupings, almost like three different groupings of, of, of bodies. And then you have these um, columns of white in the, in the middle, these uh, kind of breaks uh, that you've built into uh, the, the rhythm of the work to kind of give a sense of, of procession and, and change. Um, so I just want to point that out and talk about those three these palettes and how they come together, not just visually, but also conceptually. This side of the wall in which we have these kind of, I think of them as these kind of columnar, like these volumes that are so bodily and they're almost like anthropomorphic to me because you've described them to me kind of as bodies walking. And then on the other side of the uh, installation, is are the, are the diagonals, um, which we might be able to see in some other uh, images. And those diagonals are kind of what you were talking about earlier, the kind of fire, that kind of energistic quality. And those diagonals um, kind of come together uh, kind of in and around the window wells as you're kind of looking out. Um, another concept that you had told me about in terms of uh, how you were thinking about the work was this idea of the museum as a gathering place, as a gathering place um, that you uh, clearly responded to in terms of Black Lives Matter, seeing all the um, the protests, um, the actions, the markings on the building, um, and thinking about the museum as kind of you know speaking of fire as a kind of hearth, a place that community that different people can come together. Um, and I wonder if you could just speak about that a little bit more um, and about how you see the museum, what is the museum's role right now to you as an artist who's working in a moment of such great transformation and change? And um, maybe after you answer that question, we can transition to some uh, audience questions because I think it's about that time. Yeah, I think it's important for institutions to be able to engage the conversation that's being uh, directed at them or sort of circulate surrounding them and not just uh, um, be absent from them or ignore them. And I feel that it, with the way in which the museum is absorbing the content of the show into it and the way that the structure of the new renovations absorb the city, that bring the city into the space itself, it's to say that we're it, we're all in a we're all together to address the situation. We're all together to open up the conversation to the floor of the people, and I see this work in the, in, in this respect. With the we talked about the divides in there, the divides do a lot of different things. And on one hand, they make it a painting. If mm -hmm. it were without, if those divides weren't there, it could be be one long mush of color mm -hmm. just going through the space, formless except for the ceiling and the floor that shape the columnar space. But those white spaces also give it identification as paintings in the space uh, formally and, 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 and aesthetically. But then I can think of it institutionally, does, the, does, does this thing need to be declared as a painting because of that white as well? Does the white as an institutional uh, uh, concept uh, come to make that painting realized? And that's the other thing I'm thinking about beginning to think about more in the way in which it's being used. So on one hand, it's it's isolating the space to be able to have allow the viewer to focus on the space. It's giving pause in the rhythm of the space and it's giving space for the color to breathe a bit together in different sections. But then there's this other idea that I just mentioned about it is the institutionalization of that, of that color. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I'm thinking of this as just, um, um, you know, I'm thinking of the different sections coming together in a way that 
it's not necessarily opposition yet again between the different experiences of color in the wall and it's not opposition as we might see the white on the wall but it's to understand how all of this comes together to become this bigger contextual space in a sense when we have people marching in the street and we have the police out there it's not just to, to it's not just to like say um uh, be trite in making things just black and white mm -hmm. and making it about this people versus group of people versus this institutional force but it's about actually trying to engage the complexity of what are what is the police what is the history of the police what what are what is their purpose can this purpose be uh, uh, enacted by other types of people can we reflect upon the nature of this group this group of people called police and see what was the meaning and foundational structure of these people placed in this position of power and were there was it actually good ill will that formed the structure and creation of this force in addition to the will of being able to help society organize itself how about the crowds of people what are the interests of the crowds of people and i was so interested in looking at these bodies these actual bodies in space and seeing all the multitude of difference in this, in this space coming from different neighborhoods with different interests and different focus not being this is a term i was thinking of earlier trying to think of earlier one dimensional mm -hmm. and i don't want the conversation of painting to be one dimensional either people look at abstraction let's say and only see its connection to the uh, uh, aesthetic academic uh, uh, voice that was uh, behind it and seen as something divorced from com commonality from real life when it's literally the opposite and it literally is the mm -hmm. opposite you know um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, maligned thinking that goes on with most things in the world and it's not that people are stupid but it's just that people need to be given the time and need to give time to actually think through things and that's what art the best art can do is to help to give tools and to give means in the way is in which people can spend time to contemplate and think through things and that's what i think the museum is trying to do with this exhibition by and i've seen a lot of work that's going to be put up in the show and it's very distinct and it's very different and it's very special in the ways in which people will have this experience of being able to think of many different things as they go through the show. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I, I remember something else that you said, which was about bringing that energy, and I, I'll qualify energy in a moment, but bringing that all the energy that you were kind of seeing um, outside of the building inside, this energy of the city. And that energy, it's like the fire. It is, it was a p energy of, um a great charging spirit it was energy of upheaval it was energy of um of change and it was not all you know it's not all positive this is a tumultuous yeah, it's, it's, and it's, tough time but it's, it's not all multi, pretty it's multi-dimensional and it yeah. gives us a sense that maybe you know we need to look under the surface that um and, and just something i'm hearing you're saying is that this kind of foundational understanding of kind of how things have been the foundational understanding itself has to kind of be un unmoored right and kind of moved so that we can transform and change and progress as a society and certainly in museums we're thinking the same kind of things which are what are the principles on which uh museums have been founded um what what were the guiding principles of collections are those um current or not and how do we change them and by bringing the um the energy of the city inside you know with your commission it's a wonderful opportunity to, for us to think about that it also reflect it also really behooves us to think about our responsibility reflecting that energy back and uh, yeah. i hope that this show i mean your your commission kind of principally among many many things uh in the show will will do that and give um philadelphia uh, a kind of mirror unto itself um that i can think about and think through in that multi-dimensional way and give the rest of the hopefully the country and the world if people travel and can come see the show uh, a chance to discover all of that uh nuance and and complexity of philadelphia 
Yeah, um, I mean, things, things, good things are not built in a day. Right. And it takes time to make anything really great. Like, I think that the show will be seen in the way in which care was taken along the way. Uh, it was, it's important for me to put, bring in that first image because I wanted to talk about that, that fight that those young students had as undergraduates, as young as they were, mm -hmm. was something that motivated other students folk going forward and put a great change in great sense of responsibility, but pride in the people that they can actually have their voice heard in an institution like an academy, not right. just be professed and spoken to and being told that you have to learn this stuff this way, but to say, no, we want to bring ourselves into the learning process and we want to bring our truth into what we want to speak coming from this place. And so it's like the protesters out there who were out there all summer long, out mm -hmm. there all year long protesting things from the election all the way to uh, uh, George Floyd and in the in his death, it was to say that you know we're putting we're putting our lives on the line for something, and we have to be here every day, and we have to commit to this because mm -hmm. it's not going to change in one day, and that is what they did, you know, and right. this is what I'm inspired by because I have to ask my question too: Could I do some of the things that these people are doing now? Could I could I George Floyd seeing George Floyd? Um, uh, the person I'm thinking of wanting to say is J uh, John Lewis mm -hmm. and all the fighting he did for, for, for voters' rights. He was also 18, young out there and getting knocked in the head. Would I be in those marches with the kind of violence he had to face and all the people who were with him had to face? It's, it's really tough out there, but you know, Philadelphia is Philadelphia strong. And, those, and these people were out there on the streets doing all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a very inspirational, uh, but also transformational. And that's really the a really a key part of what we're all feeling right now. Um, I'd love to just in the interest of time, get to a couple of questions from our audience. I know Greg is standing by. I know we're basically at we're basically at six, but maybe we could get in a couple of questions since we started a little bit uh, late, but I'll leave it to Greg to to help moderate and, and select a couple for us. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Um... So we have, there's a couple questions along the same theme. It's kind of a practical question, but um, it's kind of about the permanence or impermanence of, of um, these, uh, your murals in particular, your wall paintings. So are they removed after the exhibit? Um, do you sometimes you know, transfer them in any way to preserve them? And then there's another comment that's, that's asking the same thing, um, but she's also mentioning that if not, there's a sense of sadness and anxiety uh, knowing that they will be painted over. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little bit, Odile. Um, I always kind of, this is where I was, could say I was very influenced by the artist Onkwara. I mean, he, I loved as a graduate, undergraduate student, I would have just had a, just a response to his activity as a conceptual artist, but as an artist, being able to just uh, speak so ephemerally about life and the situations of life. And so for me, a large part, and if you, one doesn't know Ankara, he made date paintings that the day, the paint, if you see the date paintings, March 23rd, uh, 1995, that would have been the day the painting was made. And then he also collected things on that day to prove or to say this date existed and I existed with it. And before that, he made postcards that he would send out saying, I am alive. And, and, and send them out to friends. But for me, the paintings on the wall are about being there and seeing it because painting and art is about seeing it. It's very interesting to be in this lockdown and look at art through uh, Zoom, speak with students through Zoom and have the question of what, is it, what does space mean when you're, and what does depth mean when you're on Zoom? I can, see dimen I can see the dimensions of your room, Erica, but I don't know what it really is because I have only this computer screen. And as my hand is here, it's now behind the computer. And that's, that's mm -hmm. the space that I'm in right now. But for me, it's, 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 it's uh, the idea of life that, you know, as, as we will get back into the world, you experience art by physically being, being there. You experience a person by physically being and interacting with them. And so for me, it's not a matter that this labor was spent to make something that will disappear, but the fact that there was this love and care and idea behind the work that was meant, that wanted the work to be there, that wanted to be the, the work to be there for the people who have the opportunity to view it. I never saw that image of the all you fascists bound to lose, but the image, the memory of it in that photograph is quite powerful. The idea that somebody would 
write that on all those steps is really quite powerful. And the idea that the rain will wash it out the next day is also very powerful. So if you have the accident of being able to see that at the moment, it's kind of a thrill to know that, wow, I was there. And that's what that work is about. The Thank process you. That that work is about. Um, so we have another question here, um, and I think this is, you know, especially since you started talking about the Zaria Art Society. Um, can you discuss the non-Western aesthetics reflected in your work? And um, and there's also a, a point here about the, what they might offer to viewers coming from a Western tradition too. Well, it's it's really, in, for me, it's in the way in which I think about the work. And if I'm to look at non-Western or say Western work, I can talk about where does Cubism come from or where does the ideation of Cubism come from? Where does the ideation of uh, the, the um, the Russian constructivists and relationship to their folkloric the beginnings or origins come into the that conceptual work called suprematism. So I'm talking about thinking about the nature of folk knowledge and technology and conceptualism and the intelligent mind uh, from one space into another. That these spaces are not divided and are not separate from each other, but are always informing the mind from the past and the intelligence of the past is always informing the present. And then we can reinterpret the past as we engage our present. So we have the sense of time. And, and then if I'm talking about the sense of geography, I'm going to look at how the in the West, artists are always looking outward and eating, consuming information that is around them historically and in the present. So we can talk, so other people might talk about um, um, uh, conquest or colonization or, or you know, um, co-optation of, of ideas. And that might be seen as actual and also negative, but we can also talk about the ways in which dialogues among artists have occurred throughout time and the sharing of information has built uh, the voice and the information that artists are dealing with today. So in my work, when I'm talking about uh, the growing sense of Africa, I'm talking about my explorations through the idea of it being removed from it, learning about it through my parenting, through my, my parents parenting me, um, uh, my education, which was about a certain kind of osmosis of, a, of an experience, being around people who uh, le I learned from as well, let's particular, let in particular say the Inca group. And I'm talking about and thinking through, my father is a historian, um, and my father as a, as a Nigerian telling me stories, mythic stories about um, life he experienced as a young person and life there. And if I'm going to talk about that sort of thing, I'm gonna talk about how anybody learns anything when they talk about experiences with parents, brothers and sisters, family, friends, society, culture, and then talking about that is to say that this is what forms their identity and forms their experience as a human being. And mine is as complex as the next person in the sense that there are many different sources. Uh, I've traveled a lot, but that doesn't even matter. If you have different sources, you're going to be able to use that to build who you are. Thank you. I think maybe we have so many great questions here, but I think maybe we'll, we'll just do one more. Um, so uh, I think we have a number of people who are, this is back to process again, but um, uh, wondering about if you sketch out ideas prior to, I, I guess, the installation, seeing the space, or if it's really about letting the space you're going to paint in move you first, um, or a little bit of both. It's a lot of both, actually. I mean, I can't, um, it's, for me, it's, 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 and I, if I didn't say it, I want to say it again, it's very important for me to understand the idea of what I saw when I was going and traveling around a lot to different shows and being always around the world and so forth. I saw this jet set artist thing that I wasn't really enamored by. I just didn't like it. Um, it, it was, I mean, I love music and rock music, all sorts of things, but I didn't like this jet set artist thing where it's coming into this new space, making something, presenting something from studio or the gallery, and then just leaving. It's kind of this tourist thing that I just didn't care for. I, was a, I, I like, to spend time in a place. I like to learn about the place I'm going to and to find out what's special about the place. Every place has something special going on. And so for me, that became a sort of, sort of motivation in the way in which I'm going to make this wall work. I wanna learn about the space 
in the place I'm going to, to be able to give something to the work, energy to the work, some magic to the work, and then leave it behind with the work. So that's that's a bit of that. I do have to spend time in the space. COVID is challenging because you know I have some projects right now that I haven't been able to actually physically go into. So there's another ways and another means of being able to address, address that. And I'm seeing that now personally. But um, it's a combination of that and then a combination of using my book of drawings and, and my, uh, um, you know, I call it maybe my information books. I have books and books and books of drawings that I've had collected since the early, basically the mid early 90s that I refer to when I think about uh, possibilities, because painting for me is really that possibility. It's not about a dictate of, um, of uh, Euro American history, but it's it's about being able to challenge. And challenge is not to say to deny. Challenge is to be able to bring the past into the present and make it yours. So when I'm thinking about what I do as an artist and what I'm dealing with, when I'm dealing with abstraction or what I'm dealing with, uh, there's a question I saw about the death of painting. I'm dealing with concepts that are not only Western, but could be uh, African from what I've been told or have been told it. And I want to be able to investigate it in a way in which I can bring the questions together and realize the importance of questions. The death of painting is a very important academic Western question. I worked to a place where I don't need to ask that question anymore. Uh, all the curating I did, all the traveling I did helped me to understand that that's a foolish question for me. I understand the question very well. It deals with intellectualism, the history of information and knowledge in the West. It's a very important question to ask in the academy. For me, it became something I didn't need to ask anymore because I started to understand more my, my background and the other aspects of my background that are vital to the making of my work. And I began to understand it when I was going to studios around the world and saw that everybody's making stuff in any way they want. Mm -hmm. So why can't I make a painting too? And that became my reason and way to back into painting. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to kind of emphasize your point about place. There's been a lot of kind of Philly love showing up in the questions too, and just love for your paintings in general, Odile. So thank you. Um, this was really great to, to hear from you. And, and, and thank you, uh, Odile. Thank you, Erica. Um, I just want to thank everyone tonight um, for coming. Um, and just by showing up, you're supporting the museum. Um, if you did happen to donate, we appreciate uh, that you, you did so. Uh, that helps us keep programs running like this. Um, you can also, of course, support the museum by becoming a member. Um, so I did also want to just give another thanks to the Barnes family for supporting the talk tonight um, and mention that our next lecture will be the Rose Susan Hirshhorn Behrend Lecture shifting borders of the Americas on April 29th. So we hope to see you there. Um, there will also be a survey that will pop up when you close uh, the Zoom window um, so that we would just ask that you fill that out by Sunday, March 28th, if you wanna tell us um, how we're doing. So thank you again, Odili. Thank you, Erica. Um, thanks to Steve Kiever, our AV support. Um, and Greg, can I just add, just to clarify, because I saw a few questions uh, in the tattoo. Um, Odili's uh, wall installation, Walls of Change, can be seen at the museum starting in May, early May, I believe it's May 7th. Yep, May 7th. Uh, so please join us in person to come experience uh, his work and the work of um, 25 artists who are connected to Philadelphia as part of New Grid Art in Philly Now, the New American Art Wing, and many other things that you'll see that are brand new in the museum. So um, you'll be able to, when you walk into the West Entrance, you'll be able to turn uh, right, no, sorry, turn left and find these new spaces. Right is American, left is us. And uh, we are just in times of, uh, you know, the pandemic and COVID, we understand that everyone uh, can come at the same time. We hope that um, you know if you're feeling safe and able and healthy that you you show up and see these great new spaces that we have and we look forward to seeing you in person. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Odile. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, and Greg, say please save the questions for me because I, I I love to read them. I learn from them, so definitely I'll send them your way. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.